Strength. Where do you draw your strength from? That's an easy question for a Christian. And we thank our Father for it being an easy question because it is from Him that that strength flows. We're, gonna, we're going to begin today in chapter 5 of the great book of Isaiah, kind of to see what the end generation looks like, what Father warned us would transpire. And then in the 16th verse of that great chapter, there is a promise. And these promises of God are something that you really need to be aware of. Because that's the way you communicate with him when he says, remind me of my promises. So this is, you'll all remember in the eighth verse is where God said, woe to you that build house on the house. And we're worse than that today. We build house on top of house on top of house on top of house to huge towers that people like to bring down. And, and naturally, crime, disease, and many things go with that, but we continue to do it. And, and people seem to, if anything, migrate more from where they join field on the field and stack up house on the house. And this causes much trouble in communities that really isn't necessary when you have God's spaces. But that's just one of the little warnings he warned us about. Drop down to the 13th verse, we're gonna pick it up there. And chapter 5, the great book of Isaiah, verse 13, it reads, Therefore my people are, are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished. Famished for what? They don't have any truth. And their multitude dried up with thirst. Thirst for what? For hearing the word of God. I thank our Father daily that He has given us a platform that goes around the world, that we're able to share that water, that truth to a thirsty land, because certainly we're in that generation. And God holds us responsible. And that's a wonderful responsibility. Knowledge also provides strength, because it keeps you from um, perishing, quite frankly. And that water, that truth, as you absorb it, strengthens you. Verse 14, Therefore hell hath, no, hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. Those that enjoy these times of going against the plan of God, hey, get ready for it. You're going to have a nice trip. 15, and the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. 16th verse is why we came here. Listen to it carefully. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. He is the Lord of righteousness. He judges fairly. He knows what's in your very heart. He knows what you mean and what you think, and He blesses accordingly. But that's the whole point in a troubled land where people are thirsty. If God has gifted you, thank Him for that gift and know that there is a thirsty world out there that needs to be watered. And certainly there is as it is. Our Father judges rightly and gives strength where strength is necessary. 17, then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat one shall strangers eat. That's fair. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as it were with a cart rope. Those that seem to just like to, put, they don't have enough sin within themselves, they like to pull it around with a whole cart load behind them. They say, let man make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. Uh, they say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. Oh boy, are they going to. How precious you are if God has given you eyes to see and ears to hear. For certainly you know that day of judgment and you know it's fair and right. But those that dare him, oh my. 
20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You know, that's what the world is today. It would seem that you are praised if you believe in murdering babies. You know, you're in the right track. But if you stand up against murder, if you stand up against those things, then you're considered odd. So the world is turned upside down. And certainly, thank God you're separated from it, that you have eyes to see and ears to hear, and that you can understand. And as people migrate in bunches, much as we seen yesterday at the, at, uh, the Lincoln Memorial, communists celebrating right here in this nation. When you saw all the red, that's what that was. Okay. 21, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. 22, woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink. In other words, they get their courage from a bottle. And you've seen, the t you've seen it. And, but get your strength from God. That's where you want your strength to come from, not a false strength. Which justify, 23, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteous for the, for the righteousness of him. 24, to complete this reading. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff. So their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Without knowledge you will perish. Thank God that He has given you eyes to see, and ears to hear, and to understand knowledge. To understand, example, the six trumps, the six vials, the truth of God, that He has given you that wisdom and that knowledge whereby you see, you know, and you understand. Therefore, your works are not going to go up in smoke. They're feeding the thirsty ones, pulling and saving people from that deception, for that deception is certainly rampant in these end times. Turn now to Isaiah 41. Isaiah chapter 41. Verse 8. But thou, Israel, art my servant. Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Being a friend of God is a wonderful thing. It means you're hooked in right where the strength is given. 9. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, that means the end times even, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. This is divine help from Almighty God. God loves those that love Him. This is why you don't want to let a day go past that you don't say, Father, I love you. I may not be perfect, but I sure do love you. I have my faults, but I love you. Forgive me and use me. I'm here. You want to do that. Because, why? Because He loves you. Verse 10, this is why we came here. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen, that's the word, I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. You can count on it. I want you to know this word strengthen is amatsa. And it means to be alert for one thing, to make you alert and to give you courage, to make you alert of what's happening in this world and what you must know to, and ascertain whereby you're an overcomer. You're not one that perishes. And you know beyond any doubt, God is with you. He strengthens you. Whereby whatever task He gives you, you can cut it. 
It may be the days may get long and the time's rough, but when you're with Him, you can cut it. Why? He gives you the strength. And that strength flows with His blessings. Always thank Him for that. Verse 11, Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing. And they that strive with thee shall perish. You know, when, when you think people come against you as a Christian, don't worry about it. God will take care of it. He strengthens you and weakens them. You can believe that. It is real. Verse 12, thou shalt, uh, thou shalt seek them and shall not find them. Even them that contend with thee, they that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. They're nobodies, okay? They're non-persons. So don't you even take time worrying about them because they're, they're not going to hurt you. They cannot hurt you because God is with you. God strengthens you. It is wonderful to have eyes to see and ears to hear. What a blessing. Verse 13, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. A little help from God goes a long way. That's all you need. You don't need anybody if you've got God. God protects you, strengthens you, and those that do hear and those that have eyes to see will be drawn to that thirst, that water. And that water is not man. That water is Christ, the living water. Once you partake of it, you'll never thirst again if you'll not stray from it. Verse 14, fear not, thou worm, Jacob. That means, Jacob, you're a weak man, and in the flesh you are weak. And ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth uh, that shall thresh the mountains and beat them small and shall make the hills as chaff. You know who that is? That's Christ. Thank God Christ has given this chapel a platform that goes around the world, a fantastic threshing instrument that takes that truth, regardless of what, takes that truth whereby people can hear that are thirsty and starving for truth and understanding, stability, a foundation. And that foundation and the strength that comes from it is none other than Christ himself, that threshing instrument. He's coming back, and he's not coming back as a babe to be crucified. He's coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords. And he has a rod of iron for those that go against those that would contend with that work of his, that threshing instrument. The 16, thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away. That's a bad spirit. And the whirlwind shall scatter them, and thou shalt rejoice in the Lord and shall glory in the Holy One of Israel. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Being a part of taking that thirst and healing it, taking that word forward, and being a part of that ministry is a fantastic thing. Why? Because God is in control. Because God directs and God upholds how fantastic it is that he heals that thirst. And he, because it's a thirst for truth, for understanding. You can see, if someone does not have eyes to see, what a confusing world this is today with over here on this side, they'll say one thing, and then on this side, it's something else. And in the center, it's something else. And people will never take the time to pick this up off times, to find out what God has to say, because that's how it's going to be. Not as some man might think, or not as someone else. God will never forsake those that try. Verse 18, to complete the reading in this chapter, I will open rivers in high places, and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water, 
in the dry land springs of water. He will water them. What? With truth, with the spirit of the living God. How precious our Father is that He cares. When people cry out to Him, help me. That's what He just got through saying. I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will be with you. And so it is that as long as you stay and as long as you're, you're asking him, he's not going to desert you. But being a part of that instrument is an awesome responsibility. It takes discipline and stick to itness. You can't just out flit around and serve God. It won't work. God expects loyalty to keep that water flowing and that truth where that the unlearned can grasp it, can be blessed with it. We thank him for his word. This is where you find it, right here. Okay, let's go to the book of Psalms, Psalms 84. Psalms 84 is the psalm of the wine press, Gittith, the, and it's for the Feast of Tabernacles, which we've just completed, and I'm so proud of our family here that took care of everyone there and was such wonderful host. Through that fall fellowship, many, many people received a blessing, and we thank our Father for that and the privilege of being allowed. But this Psalms 84 is um, from Korah to that wine press, that pre presents the very blood of Christ, ultimately. Verse 1, How admirable, how dear, are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. The house of God, whether it's out in the desert, whether it's here, wherever it is, God's there. His tabernacle, that is to say, when you come into his house, how precious it is. When you have him in your heart, and you have his word in your heart. How admirable it is. How precious it is. Verse 2. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. In this troubled world it should, beloved. I'm telling you, when you see people misled and when you see them suffering, you need to cry out to the Lord that he can use you to reach with that water, that water that heals and that, that quenches that thirst forever, spiritually speaking. How precious it is. Verse 3, Yea, the sparrow has found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Even they are at peace. And when you're in the house of God, you should be at peace. For he is the prince of peace. Verse 4, Blessings, blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee. Selah. Selah means to stop and pause. We're going to make a connection. We're going to make a connection between those that are in the house of God and those that are outside and may be coming. Why? Because you're, sp you're spreading that water you're spreading that truth. And do you know what it does? It draws them. Instead of having a cord that draws to sin, then it is the true water that draws to the house of God and eternal life. Verse 5, Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them. That is to say that sets the ways, the highway. Christ is the way. Blessed is the man whose strength is in God. Why? Because it's not going to let him down. It's going to be there. That's man or woman. There's no gender there. That if you, if your strength comes from God, it will always be there. Don't ever quit or you will be sorry. He will strengthen you. That is his promise and you can count on it. Verse 6. Who passing through the valley of Baca, Make it a well 
the rain. Do you know what this rain is? This rain is the latter, early rain, the very early rain. Also filleth pools. Do you know what this is really saying? Do you know what baka means in the Hebrew tongue? It means weeping. You poor me babies, let your weeping and sorrow for yourself, let those tears turn into rain that brings in the early truth and makes a well that satisfies thirst for those that are thirsty. Change and let him strengthen you and turn the valley of weeping into a valley of joy in serving God instead of yourself. That's what the, word, the, the scripture means. How, how precious it is, too, to see a conversion like that. It's beautiful. It's precious. Verse 7, they go from strength to strength. It doesn't run out. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. God is our strength. You know, many of you might say, well, I sure get tired. Well, stop it. Well, it just seems like I get discouraged sometimes. Stop it. You better get back to Becca. Feel sorry for yourself. Let your tears turn into water that helps people instead of feeling sorry for yourself. Grow up and serve God. Verse 8, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer and give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. And here we have that again, the audience that was outside. Let's see if they come. Verse 9, Behold, O God, our shield, he'll shield you from the world and look upon the face of thine anointed. Look at the Messiah, Father. Send him. 10, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. Just one day there. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And, and it's real easy to get out in the world in the wickedness rather than serve God when he gives you a responsibility. It's real easy, but it doesn't please God. Verse 11, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. He always does. It's so beautiful. No good thing will, be with, will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. It's all yours. You can count on it. All you'll, you, we all trip and stumble at times, but God strengthens us. Don't ever forget where the well is that you find that strength. It's Christ. And what a threshing instrument he has given this chapel. I thank him for that. And I thank him for the strength to ring that big trumpet down there that goes around the world and brings peace and comfort to those that need it in this, these terrible times. Verse 12 to complete, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in you. There's no gender in that. Blessed is the person that trusts in you. Put your trust in him. You can do that. Don't put your trust in man. He'll let you down occasionally. Don't put your trust in any woman, man, or anyone else. Put it in God. And God will always strengthen you. He will always give you the strength to get his work done. And that's what's important. Now, we're going somewhere that is very special. It was Hezekiah's wedding. But in prophecy, it is Christ's wedding in the end times. So it gives you a picture in closing of what it will look like at the very wedding of Christ and what will be going on and what it is that you had better be doing. If you want to be there, if you want to participate in the wedding, there are certain qualifications and the very title of the psalm uh, gives you the quali that qualification. Psalms 46, please. It's important that you note the title of the psalm, 46. To the chief musician, and not to Korah. For Korah died at, at um, a divine death. I'll put it that way. But this is to his sons, which it doesn't apply. A song upon Alamoth. Now, do you know what Alamoth is in the Hebrew tongue? It's important. It sets the whole stage. It's... It is virgins, okay. and it means 
virgin bride of Christ at the end. How do you not be a virgin? Is to worship Satan before Christ comes here because we're speaking spiritually. To even participate in this. You cannot be of Satan. You must be of Christ. In other words, you can't fall off to the false Messiah and participate in this wedding that we're about to speak of. And as I say, this is very fitting for there was a beautiful wedding here yesterday that's kind of symbolic also. We thank our Father for that. So here is the song of the virgins, if you would, the virgin brides of Christ as mentioned in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. Let's hear it. Verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very pleasant help in trouble. Don't ever forget that if you are one of those virgins, spiritually speaking. He is where your protection is. He is where your strength comes from. Verse 2, therefore, therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea? God is going to bring a great shaking in the end. You might as well get set for it. But if you're part of this wedding party, you have nothing to worry about. Verse 3, though the waters, that's the people, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. that means you stop and you think just a moment. This connection of the roar of the people with the beautiful, silent word of Almighty God in connection thereof. Do you have it? Is he in your heart? Have you told him you love him? That's what's important. This day is coming when this earth is going to be shaken. Another, another scripture where this is made very clear before we continue is Hebrews chapter 12. And it is made very clear there how you prevent the shaking. This, this, this will eliminate any fear you might have in the end times and even look forward rejoicing to it. Christ is that rock that you are upon that prevents you from, uh, inoculates you and makes you immune to any shaking that might go on because you're standing on Christ. And do you know something? He loves you. He cares for you. He waters you. So the connection now with the calmness. There is a river. Runs deep. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Not that roaring. Not that upset. Not that confusion that's in the world but in the house of God is that deep water that satisfies thirst and lets you know what tomorrow brings. Man only, man's not afraid of tomorrow if he knows what's in it. Man only fears the unknown. And what God is doing, he's telling you exactly how it's going to be. Verse 5, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her in that right early. He's not going to let you down. How could you fear the end times with a promise like that to his bride? He's going to be with you. He's going to strengthen you. He is going to help you. If you're deserving, if you're doing his work, and you're getting it done, if, 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 take the gifts that God gives you and use them well. And be part of this. Verse 6. The heathen raged and kingdoms were moved. And he uttered his voice and the earth melted. If you want to run with that crowd, that's what happens to them. It's, not, it's much better serving the Lord than it is out with the heathen. But if you love running with the heathen, let it be known. This is what's going to happen. You can count on it. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. It's the only, you know something? It's the only place you can find that protection in this generation. 
is with him. When Jacob is used, it's natural man, and natural man needs that help, that protection. And here we're going to connect the peace with that promise to the fulfillment of it to complete this lecture in the next three verses. Here is the completion. Verse 8, come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. We're looking at the end times when he sets it right. When the rudiments are destroyed in this earth, as it is written in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, rudiments just as the wicked part, not the good part, doesn't bother you. Verse 9, he maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. Not going to be anymore. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Not going to be any more war after that. What a wonderful time that's going to be. That's the second advent. Christ will have returned. I hope you're in that party. It means not being deceived by the false Messiah. Therefore, spiritually, you're a virgin waiting the great wedding by all my, to Christ himself when he appears at that second advent, bringing in that truth. But yet at the same time, through the comforter, watering the fields, watering the people, whereby they have that truth, that strength, and that courage. What a wonderful Father we have. Verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. That's why he'd be exalted there. But it'll be a long day in the millennium when it comes to pass. You don't want to wait that long. You want to be with him now. You want to be useful to him now. Verse 11, to complete this lecture, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Shelah. And this connects this with the next chapter, which carries on the same thought. But the important thing, God is our strength. You know, that's the only place you can draw sure strength. But again, that word I mentioned in the Hebrew tongue, it means to make you alert. That strength makes you alert. Alert to what? Prophecy. Alert so you know what tomorrow brings. Alert so that you're prepared beforehand. Again, as I stated, man only fears the unknown. Once you're alerted to events and God speaks to you and leads you, then you have nothing to fear but fear itself if you were to be drawn into it. But you're not going to. Why? Father is God. Yahweh Almighty is our Father. Do you know He is your real Father? He created your soul, your very being. He likes nothing better than for you to lean on Him and to let Him know that you love Him. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the Word. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse, Father, as you lay it out to us, Father. Thank you for strengthening us. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to take the tears of the people and spread them into an early rain, Father, of bringing truth and satisfying thirst around this world. What a destiny, Father. We love you and thank you so much for the privilege of being allowed to participate. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. What you do all the time, but he does love you, 
And you know what he wants in return? It's real simple. It's something everybody has if, if you truly appreciate what he's done for you. He wants your love. He wants you to return that love. That's only right and fair and it is righteous, meaning doing what's right, is to let your father know you love him and appreciate his protection, for he protects those he loves and those that love in return. How precious it is to be a child of the living God. You are. Let him know you love him. Won't you do that, Father, around the world? We come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to get right into it here. We got Holly from Illinois. And uh, you're welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed the program. I wanted to ask you about rewards. What are your thoughts on this subject? As there are many verses people use to talk about rewards in heaven and say each person will get more or less rewards for what they have done in the body. Is this true and how can this be when everything good we do in this body comes from him by his grace even our faith comes by him, doesn't it? There's one thing that does not come from him. That's why that's what he desires. If it came from him, he could simply order it and it would be done. But you see, he can't force someone to love him or buy their love or order it. Then it would be false. He does not want false love. He wants you to love must originate within each entity, each child of God. And that's what he wants. Hosea 6.6, 6, documentation. I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your love. I want your grace. So that belongs to you, and you had better thee well share it. Or as, which is, and in part makes up the very base and foundation of Revelation 14.13, which says what? The only thing you can take with you, you could own half of this world, the properties on it, but the only thing you're going to take with you is the work you have done here on earth for him. That goes with you. And that is a work of love for him. And that work, as it is written in Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8, makes the righteous acts that weave together the fine linen that you wear in heaven. If you don't have any works through your love for him, you don't have any fine linen, so you're naked. So there, there, are, there are differences when you knock on the door of heaven. Okay, and, and uh, naturally, that's why we have the book of life. Everything is written and everyone is judged by what is written in the book of life. And what is written in the book of life by each person's name is by their own choice because it's what they have chosen to do. They can't blame somebody else. It's too late to be pointing fingers and blaming others. You fess up, you did it, it's written, end of story. God's the judge, okay? But what does he want? He wants your love, and he can't order it and will not. That's the one thing God will not do, is force someone to love him. He wants the real thing. Ruby from Tennessee. Uh, I heard you say something, and I don't hear real well, but I heard you say something last week about a burial place in Loudoun County, Tennessee, Bat Creek Road, Please tell me all you can about this. I am very interested in it. Well, it's a documentary we did there. And in the early 1900s, they, there was uh, archaeologists that were uh, digging a mound there in Loudoun County, Tennessee, in, at, on Bat Creek. And they found nine priests buried there. And with the Hebrew uh, writings present, ear spools, and a stone, which is called the Bat Creek Stone. And on the stone, as far as I know and published, I'm the only person that has interpreted it correctly. Because to in, in as much as priests were buried there, you have to put yourself in the shoes of priests and be knowledgeable of what the priests were knowledgeable of, or you're not going to interpret it. Because, first of all, the first letter is resh, 
but it's pointed the wrong way for most people. It faces right. And you see, you always faced east or right, and that resh with a, a leaf, a resh, a leaf, is the Lamb of God. And what the stone actually, in other words, that, that is a part of a Maseratic note. To be a priest, you would know that. If you weren't a priest, you wouldn't even recognize it as a resh because you wouldn't understand the scripture. For example, Ezekiel chapter 1, you always, when, when concerning God, you face east or you face right. You do what's right. You fish out of the right side of the boat. You don't go left. No lefties. And, and, and then it says, let, concerning these nine priests that were there, Beery, it said, let the voice of God be the poker that breaks these, rakes these firebrands to him. That's the correct tr uh, translation of the Bat Creek Stone. The, the stone itself is in the Smithsonian Institute. Now, it's not in Loudoun County. The mound is still there. Um, it's pretty well protected, uh, and yet at the same time it isn't, which is kind of sad. The town should be very proud of that little mound. It, it is some real history, but yet because of property being sold there, they don't want too much attention brought to it, afraid that an archaeological dig might cause the sales to have to go away and a big developing housing developing and land developer owns the, all around it. They don't want that information known. But we helped them out. We made it known. Jackie from Texas. Um, I, I know you have said in, that the mark of the beast is not a physical mark or on our forehead, but rather what we think in our mind. Well, that's what you worship, okay, naturally. But what does in your hand mean? It means doing his work. You know, this, a lot of people, once they believe in something, they're going to work for it. You know, if, if you join a particular church and you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to assist, you're going to help. But when they join Satan's church, they're going to think it's the Messiah, but it's anti-Messiah, anti-Christ. Why, well, why would they do that? Well, they haven't read God's Word. They haven't studied it with understanding to know the false Christ comes first and they will worship him. They will do his work. This is the same way as written in Mark chapter 13 where it says, Woe to those of the child and that give suck when I return. Meaning they have spir speaking spiritually, not physically. There's nothing, no sin in a woman carrying a child in her womb. But to be spiritually impregnated by the false Christ when you're supposed to be a virgin bride waiting for the true Messiah to return and you're even nursing his work along or helping it, that is the equivalent of um, receiving the mark in your hand. You're, you're practicing that worship and that's what separates you from God. Cecil from Louisiana. Oh, Pastor Murray, I, I want to know, is it a sin not to go to church? I like to get up early every morning and to hear you read the Holy Bible. I am sorry I can't write like I should, but I, well, I, I can make out what you're saying and uh, you're, you're doing right real good. We are a church. And when you get up in the morning and you study with us, this is an extension of our church. You're in church. Why? Because we teach God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That pleases our Father very much. And He loves you for getting up early in the morning. And you know, when you give a beautiful message like this, your handwriting is just beautiful. Don't you worry about it. Uh, Sterling from Florida. Where, where in the Bible does it say God married Israel? Um, Isaiah 54, 5. Isaiah 54, 5 says uh, he, we're, he's our husband. Okay. Uh, and of course, in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, he divorced her. Okay. I mean, gave her a bill of divorcement. This is why that when Christ died on the cross, she was free to remarry. And when you accept him, uh, then you know that. Right. But there is another wedding coming, and, um, and, and w I hope you participate in that, all right? 
Isaiah, I'll say it again, 54, 5. He, we're his planting when it comes to trees, and we're his husband, Eshai, in the Hebrew tongue. Colleen from Connecticut. What is the difference between the soul and the spirit? Does the soul die when, with the body? Your soul never dies. God is not the God of the dead, but the living. Your spirit is the intellect of your soul. Your soul, probably an oversimplification, but it's yourself. Whichever body you're in, you're the same old being. And it is your very being, regardless of what dimension you're in, whether the spiritual dimension or this dimension. But your thought process or your spirit is, is that thought process that you can cast it on others. It is a spirit. You can, you can use your spirit to teach people the real word of God, to assist people, to help people, to be a good impression of people, or you can use it to really be a downer, okay? To harm people, to, to, to cause damage, to tear up, to destroy rather than build. Uh, this is man's spirit. That's why, well, that's his intellect. That's what he wants to do. Maybe not plan, and sometimes there are handicaps that cause people to do things destructive that maybe they didn't intend. But yet, nevertheless, that's how it is. That is our spirit. God has a spirit also. It's called the Holy Spirit. But don't ever forget, Satan has a spirit. And his little evil spirits like to interfere, if at all possible, God's work. Be real careful. Marianne from Georgia. Where in the Bible does it say, with your stripes I am healed? With his stripes we are healed. Isaiah chapter 53. As we learned in today's lecture, it was written by Moses and the prophets exactly what would go down. And in that Isaiah 53 where it says, He took the stripes and we get the healing, it also foretold of the fact that there would be two malefactors crucified beside him and that he would be buried in a rich man's tomb, which he exactly he was. God's word always comes to pass exactly as it's written. Would you please, this is Mary from Michigan. Would you please explain what sitting in heaven naked means? Well, well, it, it means just that. Your, your righteous acts, uh, you'll read that in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. Your righteous acts make up the fine linen that you wear in heaven. If you don't have any righteous acts, as it states in chapter 3 of Revelation, as well as other places, you're going to be naked. And that's exactly what it means. You may have made it, but you're kind of a little shy on some things, covering. Vicki from Georgia. What will people be doing in heaven, and what will people be doing in the third earth age? You know, it amazes me how questions kind of follow each other. Uh, that, and that's not, it's not planned that way. These are just taken as they come in. But what will people be doing in heaven and what will, uh, in the third earth age? The third earth age is heaven. You, you can get a pretty good hint if you watch the Greek real closely in Revelation 22. Once a month, everyone comes to that tree of life and partakes of it. That's Jesus Christ. And it gives you the leaves are for healing, meaning, uh, and it's almost impossible to interpret it, whereby you get the full meaning. But it means once you partake of those leaves, you can't get, be bored. You can't be um, disgruntled. It just really makes you. And we're going to be teaching, when we complete Acts, the book of Ezekiel. And we'll be talking about those same leaves of healing before we complete that book, because when we get into the millennium portion. In heaven, it's with God. That's always wonderful to be with our Father. Everything is cool, really good. John from South Carolina. In Genesis 49, where Jacob is blessed, blessing the two sons, Levi is admitted. And I was wondering, no, he, he wasn't admitted, uh, omitted. Uh, Levi kind of had a little, but, but Levi was what? He was the priest line. And he didn't receive an inheritance because he's responsible for each of the other tribes. 
each of the reason Levi didn't have receive a land allotment was because they had to be divided into 12 parts and be the priest for all 12 tri all the other 11 tribes and uh, and so it was he was not left out okay read it again real carefully Faye from North Carolina Pastor Murray talks about seasons at the end at, that the end times will be in and I was wondering what he means by seasons. Well, I'm, I'm going by the, the book of Daniel where it states, Daniel closed the book. You're not going to understand. But in the end, the wise shall understand. God is not going to, there are four seasons in a year. Okay. And seasons concerning the end time is when you know the end is almost near then you know you're in that season. God is never going to let us know the exact instant. There will come a time when the two witnesses die in the streets of Jerusalem. The pata is what it is in the Greek tongue, arena. That there will be three and a half days exactly. And Christ will return. But knowledge from God's word lets you know those seasons. And, and that leads up to it. Why? Because of the prophecy it is written. Uh, Cheryl from North Carolina. What part of the Bible can I read to help my brother who keeps backsliding? Well, do him a real big favor and absorb Mark chapter 13. Where just before Christ returns, there's going to be earthquakes and rumors of wars and wars. But then, and, and many people are going to come saying they're a Christian preacher, but they're lying to you. Let, Christ says, don't let anybody deceive you. They'll come in my name claiming to be of me. But stick to it. Stick to the truth, for the false Christ will come first. And your brother, possibly, if, he's have ear, if he must have ears to hear, must allow the Holy Spirit to speak through him. He can be a champion of the people. He has a part in the Word of God if he'll participate. And that would mean that he had a destiny. There will nothing keep a person from backsliding quicker than knowing you have a destiny and that God trusts you enough to fulfill it. Mark 13, pull it, put it right on him, but learn yourself so that you can feed it to him properly. Richard from Iowa. If a Christian has been deceived and then comes back, can he still be saved? Absolutely. Call repentance. Who does the saving? Christ does. Christ never fails. The salvation is always there. But you have to repent and get back in good standing and have your sins forgiven. And you're fine. You're just fine. Dorothy from Michigan. What is a mamzar and where does it come from? The word mamzar is a Hebrew word that means half-breed. And, um, and that's where it comes from. It's enough said. And in Deuteronomy 22 and 3, you, the word is used there. Lou from, uh, from Ohio. Can you please explain how Cain and Abel are not Adam's children? Um, well, Adam was Cain's child. Uh, well, Adam was Adam's. Abel was Adam's son. Cain was not. Christ makes this very clear in St. John in the New Testament in chapter 8, verse 44. He lets you know who Cain's father was. You're of your father, the devil, and the deeds of your father you will do. So, and when you. Or have you ever read Genesis 3 and 4? You know, and 5? If you read chapter 4, whose genealogy is that? Well, well, it's Cain's. Do you see Adam anywhere in Cain's genealogy? No, you don't. And then go on to chapter 5 where it has Adam's genealogy and tell me if you see Cain in there. You don't. Why? Cain was not Adam's child. The, the conception took place in chapter 3, the first conception. The second takes place in, in uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And the two boys were born twins, not identical twins, but fraternal friends. Paul from Texas. 
Pastor Murray, I heard you say Adam and Eve are not the first people on earth. Can you please explain this? Well, they, God created all the races on the sixth day. That's why we've got them today. If people understood that, there would be no racial problems. God created everybody the way he wanted them, and he looked at it. It was good. And that's the way he wanted it. That's the way he created them. And then he rested the seventh day. And on the eighth day, in the Hebrew manuscripts, he created Eth Ha'adam, which is Adam through which Christ would come because he was putting salvation before the people and making it possible. Uh, Joanne from Arizona. Where can I find the chapter verses where God opened the eyes of his prophet before he went into battle and showed him the large army he had to back him up? Well, the prophet who did this was Elijah, Elisha, picked by Elijah himself. But Elisha had his man with him, and they were about to attack the whole army. And the man with him said, whoa, ha, hey, there's a whole army out there, and we're just two. And in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17, you, you will find that documented, okay? Now, I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all a great deal because why? You love studying God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, God loves you. It's the letter He sent to you wanting you to understand his emotions, his feeling, and his love for you. That's why he wrote the letter to you. And when you read that letter, it makes his day. And boy, when you make his day, boy, does he make yours. Brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Bless God again. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me. You listen good. You stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.